Welcome back for the last session of this wonderful event. It's billed as a panel um, session, but actually I think you should regard it as uh, lucky you, it's four mini talks, um, each of at most uh, eight to ten minutes, and you know the speakers, don't you? Um, I would like to say that this panel, or these mini talks, and the whole topic was my uh, idea, but it wasn't. It was actually Ursula's. Thank you very much, because I think this is a really, really fitting um, topic, and I'm really glad to chair it, because just a couple of weeks ago, I was in a very public forum, and someone asked me uh, in front of 200 people, didn't I think Ada Lovelace was a wonderful role model? And uh, <laughs> I should have thought of this one earlier. Um, I looked at him blankly and I thought, how on earth could I identify with someone who was born 200 years ago, who didn't go to school, who probably wouldn't speak to someone like me? Um, you know, I just, how can she be a role model? And then I, the next thought was, well, why do we need role models? Why is everyone harping on about role models? What I'm really interested in is that women do computer science. And why is that? Because of the contribution they can make to the science and society. But even more importantly, the joy and the, you know, the intellectual satisfaction of actually doing computing science and running a program and waiting to see whether it does what you think it would do. Anyway, all that was going through my head on, on, the, on this stage. Um, and so I think I ended up just answering something else because I couldn't get all that out in time. But I think now we actually have an opportunity to explore this whole concept of role model, of being a woman in science, uh, what it means, and, and some uh, hopefully rather provocative thoughts. Now, I've been advised we're not doing introductions of speakers uh, very much, so I'm not going to introduce our speakers. I assume you've read your programs from uh, cover to cover, but I will just add one thing that isn't in your program, which is Cheryl Prager was just awarded an honorary degree at St. Andrews University this week, so congratulations. <laughs> so I had, to, I had to stick that in. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you, I'm just going to give you a wee hint of what each speaker is going to um, speak on and then we'll just get going. So Murray Pettock's going to kick off and his strap line is misremembering women. Valerie Barr follows and her strap line is why is Ada Lovelace still the woman that young and <coughs> the not so young women look to? Cheryl Prager has strap line what has changed? And last, Sue Charman Anderson's strap line is the right to suck to be mediocre and to be imperfect. <laughs> so, off to you, Murray. Oh, and you, I have a sign that may be appropriate. Right, don't it up yet, for goodness sake. I feel that I've, uh, haven't, uh, haven't earned your confidence in that sense. Um, well, it's a, it's a great pleasure to be here, uh, first of all, and it's been a tremendous conference, even though it's uh, some distance away from what I uh, have uh, uh, much experience of myself. And I think it's been um, uh, obviously tremendously organised and supported and lovely little touches, the most recent of which, of course, being that cake, which was left, of course, uncut so that we could all take pictures to tweet. And uh, ah, I did that. Now, this conference is about Ada Lovelace's memory and how we remember her, not presumably as uh, an adulteress, as Oxford University's comms office <laughs> suggested. My contribution takes a different perspective on this central topic because the theorization of memory and how we remember is itself a major field of inquiry. And interestingly, the formulations of memory theory and cultural history and psychiatry, arrived at separately, are often compatible. It is important to raise this issue here for three reasons. First, this is a conference about how we remember women, and one woman scientist in particular. Secondly, because women are structurally misremembered in our culture. And thirdly, because even in the act of recuperating memory, we can be misled into misremembering women. A famous case of this is to be found in work carried out by my erstwhile colleague Penny Summerfield at Manchester, who found that women remembered themselves as having been excluded from the Home Guard, even when presented with their admission, paper, admission papers and documentation of their attendance at meetings. 
This is a phenomenon known as composure, where we remember what is culturally acceptable to us to remember, and the cultural memory of the Home Guard persists so overwhelmingly through the agency of Dad's Army. The clue is in the title. With a peak audience of 18 million and voted the fourth best British sitcom of all time, the sexist premise of Jimmy Perry and David Croft's 1968 comedy has changed the memories of women who served in the war. A 2016 remake, this is still topical, will, as far as I know, still not include women. But Dad's Army itself bears witness to another feature of memory theory, its economy. The loi de rarité, the principle of scarcity, where a diverse set of data and possible memories or histories are condensed through the selectivity of recall, the convergence of memories, the recursivity in remembrance, the recycling of models of remembrance and memory transfers. Now that's all getting very kind of art side theoretical. But where we take it, I'll just take a few examples. What this means is when we remember the Second World War, uh, in Britain, that means the Battle of Britain and the war in Europe. In the US, predominantly the Pacific Theatre. In Russia, the Great Patriotic War. See how much coverage of the war in Europe there is in the US televisual history of World War II? Very little. The naval struggle in the Napoleonic era is summed up by Nelson. It is for us the British Army that Wellington leads at Waterloo, this being the 200th, uh, the, the, uh, the 200th anniversary also, though only 28% of troops under his direct command were in fact British Army troops. And as we know, Tommies in World War I never come from Canada, except in the irritated Canadian film industry's Passchendaele, or India. And to take a recent example from the film Suffragette, Emily Davison's, a St. Hughes alumna, of course, death on 4th June 1913 on camera at the Derby, is seen inaccurately as transforming a marginal group of activists into a global movement. Memory, and this has become truer and truer, from the age of secular statues and commemoration which began in the 1790s to the electronic media of today, simplifies and repeats, simplifies and repeats. The cult of celebrity, the current usage of which uh, uh, as a word dates from Ada Lovelace's lifetime, grows. Individuals are glorified as teams and networks are marginalized. The story force feeds the history and live feeds are just one way that we make clear in the language of our current means of communication the narrative of the metaphors that govern our lives. Because as against perhaps some of the things that have been said today at this conference, I think perhaps one of the threats we have, uh, the greatest threats we have from technology is not its capacity, it is its metaphorical presence in our minds and lives. It's the repetition, it's the, re uh, it's the repetition, it's the way in which things are seen in a single dimension or having single causes, which has its effect on everything from public debate to cultural memory. Now this process creates and sustains greater inequalities than would otherwise persist, and gender inequality is one of these. The construction of cultural remembrance is increasingly selective, and hence increasingly unequal. It is thronged with exclusion. But paradoxically, I mean many people will say, look, we, women's history is being recovered. The role of women in science is being re recovered. The huge amounts being written, as we saw this morning on Ada Lovelace, the last 40 years, shows uh, what has been recovered and, and how well it's been recovered. But one of the risks of understanding is arguably perpetuated by those who, seeking to right the wrongs of the past, actually reproduce the paradigmatic cultural memories which, remem which misremember that past. And here, for example, is a quotation from Catherine Hughes from the Gender Roles section of the British Library website. During the Victorian period, men and women's roles became more sharply defined at any time in history. In earlier centuries, it had been usual for women to work alongside husbands and brothers in the family business. Living over the shop made it easy for women to help out by serving customers or keeping accounts while also attending to their domestic duties. No question about what is primary there. Domestic duties, working alongside husbands and brothers, conditions of support which are entirely about the private sphere. And here's a section from the state-of-the-art digital resource, The Old Bailey Online. In marriage, Men were expected to rule over their wives, and all property, except in some cases property acquired by the woman before marriage, belonged to the husband. Men were the primary wage earners, while women were expected to be primarily responsible for housework and childcare. There are, of course, different emphases in these two, but in both of these accounts, the domestic sphere paradigm of confinement and inequality is reinforced in order to remember women properly. But what is properly? 
I'm just going to give a few examples. Uh, and of course, I'm going to end with a few names of scientists, but these aren't scientists. Um, Agnes Campbell, in business from 60, 1676 to 1716, was argued with the leading bookseller in Edinburgh and succeeded William Mossman as printer to the General Assembly in 1712. She was a bookseller in the city for 40 years. A majority of women in the first street directory of Edinburgh who are not titled are described as being in business. Elizabeth Carter, Elizabeth Hatchett's money lending and pawnbroking business in 18th century London provides a starting point to research the strategies by which women, like nonconformist men, circumvented legislation designed to exclude them from debt and credit markets. One route was woman to woman lending below the radar, of which work is only just starting. Carter claimed her business was worth £18,000, well over two and a half million today, while another female moneylender of the period, Elizabeth Waltiers, insured her business directly with the Royal Exchange in 1734 because you could insure the businesses you legally couldn't own. The first example I have uh, uh, come across of universal suffrage is the election of the parish clerk at Inverurie in Aberdeenshire on the 23rd of June, 1536. And that happened to be a period when 85 of the 90 brewers in the city were female. And also a period when civil penalties were exacted against husbands guilty of domestic abuse. And there are quite a lot of that from, the, from increasing amounts from the 17th century onwards. If we take very, just very briefly, Litchfield in 1726, who wouldn't? Women are members of both guilds and merchants' companies in the city. When we remember, we need to look at the details. If we argue that women were, I could go on and on with the details, I'm not going to go any more. Uh, we, can, uh, we, can, we can argue that women were always marginalized in the past, but if we do that, we're actually going to forget an awful lot of women who contributed and who mattered. And that brings me to Ada Lovelace. There's no question that she's honored uh, 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 as, as she's being honored here and now. But isn't it strange that often the, uh, that honor is still contaminated, and we've seen that in, in, even in recent days, with how she's remembered. The Science Museum describes her as a celebrity of, from birth, and one is only a celebrity from birth if one's Ada Lovelace because of who your father is. He goes on to say, Lovelace sought to find balance between the two alternative parts of her world, the romanticism and creativity of her father and the rationality and science of her mother. And we've heard actually some papers in this conference which have taken that view and gone down that kind of bifurcated line or sought to reconcile those bifurcated lines. And that may be absolutely right in terms of Ada Lovelace's achievement. I'm not a Lovelace scholar. But what I would say is you would have to look quite a long way before you saw any male scientist who was described in terms of the intellectual qualities of their parents and the need to reconcile them. And please find one for me, and I'll eat the hat that I'm not wearing. <laughs> and we've also heard today, we've also heard, uh, 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 today that, the, that the memory of Ada Lovelace still remains contested. There are still, like Bruce Collier, very many, uh, Collier, very many skeptics who think that really she's, re she's remembered for the wrong thing, or she's remembered inaccurately, or, fr or fraudulently, or in some way which misrepresents her actual contribution. And we've heard the pushback against that, uh, against that too. Well, I think we need to be, and this is where I'll be a little provocative, I think we need to understand that, con that, that contestation of memory comes, or, what, or how we should remember somebody, comes from two different sources. It comes from a desire not to find somebody important who has long been forgotten. And it also comes from some of the claims made on that person's, on that person's behalf in an effort to make them important. Ada Lovelace has become an icon who achieved things beyond the social intellectual position of her gender, though not her class. Or, are we, uh, or is that what she is? Or are we remembering her as a convenient shorthand for what she was not? Of course, Ada Lovelace Day itself is part of a process of selectivity in memory of which memory theory as a whole has learnt to be somewhat suspicious. But if her achievements are in fact extraordinary, and that's why we're having this conference, which is an, which is an act of memory, I hope nonetheless to have left you today with a recognition of the selectivity of memory and the need to evidence what we do remember 
as well as, and this is my more controversial claim, that the structures of cultural memory function to exclude women even when they are remembered. So it is, although it isn't their day, I would also like to remember, just as a matter of footnotes to this conference, and just as a matter, once again, of extraneous detail, because uh, facts, are, uh, uh, facts are chills that winner ding and down will be disputed, the detail, or not the, de the detail of the names, if not the lives, of people like Faustina Pignati Carafa, academician of Bologna, the mathematician Maria Andrea Casamayor, Gabriel Emile, Emile Tonle de, de Berteuil, Marquise de Châtelet, the translator of the Principia, Susan Jane Cunningham, co-founder of Maths and Astronomy at Swarthmore, Mary Edwards, employee of the Board of Longitude, and Marie-Sophie Germain, winner of the Grand Prize from the Paris Academy of Sciences on Elasticity at the beginning of the 19th century. And there are many more than these random, this randomly chosen group, of course. But what I would say in looking at memory and how we remember and misremember women is that it can only encourage our, under, encourage our understanding and inspire those who come after to know that more than one went before. And the risks of selectivity are that we end up with excluding the memories of those we are not remembering in order to cultivate the remember, remembering the person we are. Ada Lovelace may be exceptional, but she is, thankfully, and looking at the reality of the detail of history, not the only exception. Thank you very much. There's one thing you have to know before I start with my remarks. You've heard about ACM yesterday morning and, and this morning. Um, so the one piece you need to know is I'm chair of ACMW, which is the ACM Council on Women in Computing. That factors in in a few minutes. The ADA initiative, ADA Fruit, the ADA Project, ADA Femme Nouvelle Technologie, ADA Developers Academy, Project ADA, the ADA Loveless Award, ADA Women in Computing Club, ADA Loveless Day, which has events over the years in the UK, Australia, Brazil, Canada, Colombia, the Czech Republic, France, India, Ireland, Italy, Slovenia, Spain, Sweden, Turkey, the USA. ADA Loveless related Facebook posts from groups in Pakistan and Malaysia. And finally, you can buy an Ada Lovelace costume from Sony Computer Entertainment Europe at the Swedish online PlayStation store. <laughs> Why? Why? Why do so many current organizations and events identify with and recognize Ada Lovelace? We are well into the 21st century. Ada was born 200 years ago today. Why do so many women today seem to look to her still as a model and an icon? And how is it that this woman who lived her life in the 1800s can be so important today to women in computing, especially when, by and large, people know very little about the detail and depth of her accomplishments? Thomas Hay and Mark Priestley discuss Ada in their September 2015 piece in Communications of the ACM entitled Innovators Assemble, Ada Lovelace, Walter Isaacson, and the Superheroines of Computing. While they make a number of good points in their piece, there are a number of problems as well. I will digress long enough to comment on one of the problems. They state that most areas of science and engineering are gradually becoming more balanced in their gender representation. This is a problematic statement for two reasons. First, they don't place that comment geographically at all. Though based on the rest of the piece, I assume that they're talking about the US. So the second problem, assuming a US focus, they have not accounted for changing demographics in the US. Today, Almost 60% of college graduates in the U.S. are women. The only accurate way to gauge relative balance in disciplines is to look separately at women's degrees and men's degrees. That perspective shows us that, in fact, we're not near balance at all. We have a long way to go. Overall, in the U.S., 11% of women's degrees are earned in the science, technology, engineering, math disciplines, STEM while 24% of men's degrees are earned in those same fields. Only biology has true gender balance. 7% of women's degrees and 7% of men's degrees are earned 
in biology. So I'm sure you're saying she's a computer scientist, right? Why doesn't she tell us about computer science? So the grim statistic, 1% of women's college degrees in the US is earned in computer science, and 5% of men's degrees are. So having set the record straight, returning to Ada, Hay and Priestley argue that the superhero narrative is not the best way to understand history. They argue for the historian's responsibility to provide accurate and nuanced stories. And they say further that history will ultimately prove more inspiring and more relevant than superhero stories. They make a compelling case, one I agree with, that we need to give more airtime to the many, many women who were involved in the development of computing as a technology and a field. And they close by saying, superhero stories have little time for ordinary humans who exist only to be endangered or rescued. Reducing the story of women in computing to the heroics of a handful of magical individuals draws attention away from real human experience and counterproductively suggests that only those with superhuman abilities need apply. So how do we make sense of this? How are we to understand the iconic nature of Ada as a figure for women in computing? And frankly, why would anyone today resurrect a figure from such a different era? Where I think Hay and Priestley go wrong is at the outset of their article, in the very title, where they cast Ada as a superheroine. I would argue that part of the value of Ada, the reason why she plays an important role, is precisely that she's not seen as a superhero. She's not seen as being magical in some way. I do believe, however, that part of her appeal is precisely because she is not of the modern world, because she comes from a different era, a different educational system, a completely different moment in time. This means that today's young women are not dissuaded by her story because they know that their life has not been and could not be like hers. So they feel no expectation that they have to be exactly like Ada in order to succeed in computing. Despite the historical differences, there's something very relatable about her for today's women. Her parents had some real problems. That's, I think, by now the polite way of putting it. <laughs> um, she did not have educational access equal to that of the men of her time with comparable intellect. And there was certainly a fair amount of micromanaging of her day-to-day -day life, certainly in her younger years. So I would suggest that there's a lot of young women in the world today who can totally relate to that. <laughs> At the same time, she was in many ways able to ignore the script that society wanted to write for her, or maybe somehow she just managed to be unaware of the parts she didn't like. She did what she wanted to do. She engaged in the intellectual pursuits that clearly drove her and excited her, and seemingly went about her business. And that is something worth emulating. Imagine for a moment, what if Ada were alive today? How would she measure up relative to some of today's female superheroes of tech. If we put Ada on the stage at the Grace Hopper celebration of women in computing, what would she talk about? I suspect she'd be up there like roboticist Manuela Veloso was last October, this past October, talking about her latest technical work, giving credit to her graduate students. Not like Sheryl Sandberg, whose takeaway message was, before you go to sleep every night, write down three things that you did well that day. If we limit ourselves to those figures who are hyped in the press today, is there anyone better than Ada to serve as a role model for today's young women in computing? As Hay and Priestley argue, we do have to do a much better job laying out who the key women in computing have been and who they are today. Until then, we have a great gap. And that gap can actually dissuade women from coming into the field. Leaders, prominent figures, superheroes stand on the shoulders of lots of people below them. But if people hear only about the superheroes, then they're dissuaded from even trying. My eye was caught recently by an online listing, top 10 women in tech. So I thought, great, I can post this to the ACMW Facebook page. 
So I started reading the list, and my next thought was, why would I post this? Given the lack of detail presented about those 10 women, there didn't seem to be, well, say, there didn't seem to be a regular person on the list. Everyone on it was young and already worth millions, if not billions. Um, founder of a company, high-level executive. Um, they had the uh, founder of Lens Technology in Hong Kong, um, Bet365 here in the UK, Epic Healthware Software, Facebook, YouTube. I don't mean to take away from the accomplishments of the women who lead these and other companies, but let's not pretend they got there on their own. Most often they had an extraordinary level of help and mentoring and coaching that is made invisible. And that makes it hard for them to be effective role models because most people don't have access to the kinds of help they had. A young woman sitting in her classroom today or banging her head against a recalcitrant bug in her assignment or working hard to get the next product release ready on time is not likely to be motivated by the story of Marissa Meyer. She might be motivated by the story of Margaret Hamilton, who developed the onboard flight software for the Apollo space program, or Sue Black, who did not follow the typical route into the field, but got her PhD when she was 39, and today is a rock star for women in computing and a champion of Britain's role in the history of computing. Or she would be motivated by the story of Dame Shirley and the route she took and the women who worked for her who had real lives and, and real careers in computing and married those together. As long as those stories are kept quiet, there's a dearth of role models for the majority of women who are in or might enter computing. In this context, I think Ada continues to serve very effectively as both inspiration and icon. Hello, <clears throat> I'm Cheryl Prager. Um, it's 200 years ago today since Ada Lovelace was born and my career as a mathematician began roughly 150 years after Ada's, if we could describe Ada as having a career. How is it possible to compare Ada's life with mine or with those of young people today I've spent far more of my time doing mathematics and science than thinking about them philosophically. I warm to Ada Lovelace, her enthusiasm and her passion for mathematics, and I admire the way she grasped opportunities. For example, the way she optimised her access to top scientific teachers and scholars. Ada's life was one of privilege, at least financial privilege, and perhaps without this freedom, she would have had no chance to develop her passion and her expertise in mathematics. She had a completely different background from nearly any of us, and the idea of an education provided solely by private tutors and also a life in high society is entirely outside of my experience. So how then can we view Ada Lovelace as a role model? Indeed, this was one of the questions for this panel was, should we do so? And what do we mean by a role model? And is Ada Lovelace a role model for women mathematicians and women computer scientists? Is she someone worthy of imitation, an inspirational ideal, an example, someone we admire and may try to emulate? What exactly are the changes that matter over these 200 years? Far more women become mathematicians and scientists with backgrounds vastly different from Ada's. For example, I was the first in my family to go to the university. Both of my parents had to finish their education after 10 years at school for various reasons. My father's father had died when dad was 14. My mother's father was unemployed after an extended illness during the Great Depression. 
And this meant that I felt my education through to university level to be an amazing privilege and I could never regard my education as a right. So if we were all to share our stories, we'd have dozens of different life situations emerging from, from this, this, uh, this session today. What attracts us and influences us when we consider someone like Ada Lovelace is not confined to her life situation, even though her life story may seem wonderfully romantic and exciting. It involves, and what attracts us, is more her, her passion for new discovery, new understanding of maths and computing, her engagement with other mathematicians of the time. And I wonder what Ada would have thought if she'd lived today having to face many queries from young people seeking to understand her life choices, especially how and why she chose to follow mathematics. There are many calls on female mathematicians and scientists to take on service roles and mentoring roles and roles involving support and enrichment for young people. The details and everyday activities of the life of a scientist or scholar has changed completely but the excitement and passion for her subject that we see in Ada Lovelace are timeless. And I could finish here, but I did think that I would say how horrified I was to see on Saturday morning that the three words used by the Oxford University mm -hmm. Press Office to characterise Ada Lovelace were genius, adulterous, visionary. How sexist, I thought. Thankfully, the, discussion, the description was changed and you can look it up yourselves. But because many of us are on, on occasions have heard statements that somehow belittle or diminish contributions, it felt unnervingly inappropriate that this description appeared on the Oxford University website in relation to Ada Lovelace. And I am very glad that it was changed quickly. Thank you. Um, not just about Ada, about other people as well. And storytelling is a key part of how we understand women's positions in STEM, both historically and in the present day. Too often, though, the stories that we are told about women do not just explore their achievements, but are also often at pains to discuss their imperfections, whether perceived or real. Ada Lovelace often comes in for a bit of character assassination, as we've just heard. Um, in another piece on the BBC recently, we learned that she was manipulative and aggressive, a drug addict, a gambler and an adulteress. That piece also described her in uh, two words, flawed or fraud. <laughs> Elsewhere, we're told that she didn't understand calculus, as if that is both unusual and a critical personality flaw. <laughs> Marie Curie suffers the same fate. In the documentary, The Genius of Marie Curie, within the first five minutes, we are told that her entire life is defined, and the word was defined, by her affair with the married Paul Langevin not apparently defined by her discoveries of polonium and radium or her work during the First World War driving an X-ray unit around field hospitals. During In Our Times episode on the Curies, we are told that she is an appalling role model for women who want to go into science because she confirms the notion that you can't be a normal woman and go into science. Never mind that the entire concept of normal is problematic, or perhaps that not all women in STEM would want to self-identify as normal anyway. <laughs> Discussions of Rosalind Franklin follow the same pattern. 
Uh, I was sitting in the car with my husband a few weeks ago listening to NPR and playwright Anna Ziegler and actress Christian Bush talk about the play Photograph 51. And from that interview, we learnt that Franklin was not the nicest person in the world. But in mitigation, we are also told that she's not terrible the entire time. <laughs> Unfortunately, we learnt nothing about Franklin's actual science. It seems that we cannot just learn about these women's triumphs. We're not allowed to focus solely on their work, their discoveries, their inventions, like we do with most famous men. Instead, these women must be brought down a peg or two through discussion of their flaws, which are used as a way to undermine the increase in status that they had gained from their success. The modern narrative form for discussing the achievements of women hinges on a false balance. A woman cannot just be brilliant, she must also be flawed. And we must hear about those flaws in detail to balance out any uppity ideas we get from her brilliance. Sadly, this is no surprise. Research shows that we judge women more harshly than we judge men. So, for example, traits like decisiveness that make good leaders out of men are interpreted negatively as bossiness in women. And rarely do commentators question the accuracy of usually male interpretations of women's personalities in the light of what we know about subconscious bias. Was Lovelace aggressive or did she just speak her mind? Was Franklin unpleasant or was she decisive and direct? Was Curie obsessed or was she just focused? The exception that proves the rule is Florence Nightingale, the lady with the lamp, the saintly nurse who saved lives. Instead, this devout, humble woman is the desired archetype for women in STEM. Not only was she supportive of traditional gender roles, her work as a nurse actually embodies gender stereotype. Conveniently, popular accounts of Nightingale often ignore completely her statistical work, her invention of the polar area graph, and her use of the infographic as a campaigning tool to lobby government for change in soldiers' barracks and hospitals because these are all decidedly unfeminine behaviours. These distortions matter. We are all creatures who depend on story to make sense of our world. The stories that we hear about others, the stories we tell about ourselves, influence how we understand the world around us and how we think about our place in it. Stories that focus on the expectation of perfection in female role models can undermine self-confidence and encourage imposter syndrome. If we only ever read highly polished accounts of women who seem like saints, we start to develop unrealistic expectations about how we should experience our own professional and personal lives. When we compare our lived experience to those edited highlights, of course, our rough and ready lives come off worse. How can we possibly live up to those expectations? <coughs> but when successful women are portrayed negatively, their every personality flaw and mistake poured over at length, that also affects how we relate to them. When we focus on a woman's flaws or mistakes, we signal that no matter how successful she is, if she's not that saint, she isn't worthy of our respect. It becomes difficult to look up to someone with such imperfections, and instead of being a role model, she becomes a warning. How we talk about female role models also affects how we assess the accuracy of the narratives surrounding them about their achievements and their legacy. We might think that the perfect female role model cannot possibly be real. She must have had male help. Or maybe she lied, or been, been re misrepresented, or been delusional. Or we might think that her imperfections outweigh her achievements, making her unsuitable as a role model. 
These narratives, these bias narratives, affect how we conceptualize ourselves. The focus on female perfection or imperfection damages our ability to make mistakes as a natural part of learning. When individual women are seen as representing all women, our mistakes are seen as proof of gender-based deficiencies. They make us less willing to experiment, to fail, to learn. Because we start to feel that our mistakes make us complicit in bolstering other people's prejudices. Over time, the stories we read about others change the stories we tell to ourselves about what we've done, who we are, what we're capable of. And these are the most important stories of all because they define our actions in the present. They define how we think of ourselves and how we locate ourselves in society. This doesn't mean that we should never examine women's personalities and mistakes, but that we need to do so very carefully. We first need to ask, is the criticism fair? Some of Lovelace's critics come from a point of view of wanting to see women alienated from technology and computer science. So they will do anything to undermine her position. Some criticism comes from a misinterpretation or misreading of the evidence. Some seems to come from the critics' own dislike of Lovelace's personality. But whatever their motivations, we need to understand the source of the criticism to assess the impact of any agenda behind it. We have to ask, is the criticism relevant? Was Lovelace's affair with her tutor relevant to her work on the analytical engine? Or her relationship with John Cross? How was that relevant? Are either of sufficient importance to her legacy that she should be headlined as an adulteress? If the criticism is relevant, is it being blown out of proportion and given more weight than it deserves? Curie's year-long relationship with the married Paul Langevin might be relevant insofar as that it provided ammunition for her academic opponents. But did it have a significant enough impact on her work to warrant being sold as the defining event of her life? So we have to understand the historical context as well of the critiqued behaviour or attitude rather than judge solely by modern standards. Nightingale's support for what we would now call gender stereotypes is not a sign of her intellectual failure. It's indicative of the societal values that she was brought up with. How we talk about women matters and it's part of our broader journey towards equality. Because true equality is the right for a woman to have a personality, any personality, and not be castigated for it. It is the right to make mistakes, both at home and at work, and be given the grace of forgiveness. True equality is the right to suck at something, to find calculus hard, and yet still have our achievements judged on their own merits. Thank you very much. Thank you to all the speakers. Um, what important messages and thoughts, and you also did it in such short time, so thank you. Um, I would like to have a, a few um, questions and, and comments, etc. but can we all be mean, mindful of time that some people have um, aeroplanes and trains and buses to, to catch? So, please. Um, and a question for you, Valerie, I uh, really related to what you said about uh, exceptional role models being uh, sometimes more paralyzing than inspira inspiring. And I wanted to ask, what is the ACM doing in that matter? <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad you asked the question I can answer. <laughs> um, is this, we're good? Um, so ACM, w, so ACM, yeah, ACM w, does a lot and in particular supports ACMW. Um, we have three main programs. Um, we do uh, regional celebrations of women in computing. These are typically um, 100 to 200 person conferences 
um, that are sh typically one day events, easy for people to get to, um, focused a lot on students to give them an opportunity to gather and create community. Um, typically a mix of research presentations, um, workshops, panels. So that's one big part of what we do. We have about 25 of those around the world at the moment. Um, we also have ACMW student chapters and professional chapters, and we're working on um, more content for those and um, being clear about what the reasons are why a general women in computing group ought to be an ACMW chapter. And the other thing we do is um, scholarships for women computer science students to attend research conferences. And unlike most of the funding that's available, we do not require the student to present. So we feel very strongly that this is pipeline. It's an opportunity for an undergrad to go to a conference and think about going on to graduate school, an opportunity for a master's student to go to a conference and think about going on for the PhD, and early PhD students to help find their research community. So those are our three main areas. And if you go to women.acm.org and click join, you'll get on, you will join 36,000 people on our distribution list and get our monthly newsletter. Motion. I want to ask about the, the role model issue from a very practical perspective. So being academic, as we know, is you carry many, many heads. So I don't know how many heads I'm carrying. But one that I don't have to carry, and none of my male colleagues have to carry, is the old model head. We just do what we do. <laughs> and I'm worried that all this talk about role models actually were making being a, a female at this academic, this is the world I'm familiar with, even more challenging. Mm -hmm. Because they have to do everything that we do, and on top of it, they have another job. And they're actually measured by it. I mean, I nominated someone recently for some kind of recognition, and, and when she didn't get the feedback, was yes, you talk wonderfully about all her, all her technical work, but what is she doing for women? It's like you're not enough to be a brilliant scientist, you also have to at the same time not to be a role model, but you have to be an activist. Aren't we making it just harder for women to succeed because we put so much emphasis on this role model issue? Can I yeah, who, who wants to die? Well, I, I want to say that within the context of ACM, I'm very, very clear that ACMW does not own the women in computing problem or the solution. ACM, as a professional organization of, of computer scientists, has to take that on. I think men can be role models. I think men can be mentors. I think men have to be mentors and coaches because there aren't enough women. But I think, and I think women, in the same way that we should have the right to suck at things, we should also have the right to say, I'm focusing on my work. So I think you raise a really important point. Some women really want to get out there and, and be in the trenches about this, and not everybody does. And we shouldn't think badly of the women who don't want to actively engage in this. And I just want to say one other thing, because Linda Herman had her hand up, that I should mention that ACM has the ACM Europe Council, and we do have ACMW Europe. Can I, can, can I, sir, can I, can I just, answer, can I just say, you and I think all the men, and indeed all the people in the audience, can also help by re taking that burden away from women and also speaking up when you hear someone say that is no why should they be expected to do that just because they are a woman. Sorry, Sue. I was going to say something actually uh, very similar, and I think that um, you identified two different roles. The first one is that of role model. Well, when we're talking about a role model, a role model is a, a person that we you know, admire and want to emulate. Um, women don't actually have to do anything but their work in order to be a role model. Um, and it shouldn't be uh, on women's shoulders to put themselves forward and say, you know, I'm a role model, you know, do what I do. They should, that should come as a, a sort of side effect, as it were, from the work that they do. Uh, you also mentioned the word activist. And this is where I think um, the idea that women are solely responsible for um, engaging with, um, with sexism and uh, with creating new role models and dealing with all of these issues is uh, fundamentally problematic, that men need to actually say, well, they're going to get involved and, and get organizing. Because quite often, um, you know, I understand uh, the perspective of women who feel like they're always the, t the woman on the committee. They're always the woman who has to, to, to sort of stand up and, and, and represent. Um, 
And a lot of that burden can be eased by men saying, you know, we will help you um, organize and, and or we will take on organizing roles that is a part of uh, what needs to happen. Um, and I think the more men do that, and I see this a lot with Ada Lovelace Day, that a lot of men will get involved with organizing events for women and about women in STEM. And there's absolutely no reason why more men can't do that. Thank you. Linda. ACM has the senior um, membership level, such as fellow or distinguished scientist, and it would be nice if all the male fellows, since there are a majority of those, were to nominate a female member of ACM to become a fellow, and that would really help to give a lot of visibility to them already doing very good work. Thanks. I, I see a uh, black jacket. <laughs> That's, me. That's your black jacket, yeah. <coughs> Thank you very much indeed for a very stimulating debate. I, the idea of role models has been around a long while, a long, long while. I mean, I'm from this country, and I think the situation in terms of computer science, particularly at an academic level, is pretty bad in terms of gender distribution. And certainly mathematics is pretty bad. Certainly in physics it's pretty bad. And this is despite a lot of really good interventions role models, mm -hmm. initiatives, showing how important careers are. And uh, I just wondered whether we need a bit more pressure and in terms of thinking about the gender distribution of uh, research grants or whatever. And I don't know, I just wonder what you think about that, because it seems <coughs> that the situation has not changed very much, uh, despite really good work done across mm -hmm. the world. Really. And I just wondered if you had some examples where you've actually seen a change representation of women. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, I don't know if it's a, a really good um, example, but I've been hearing about Athena Swan yeah. programs yeah. here. Yeah. Research yeah. councils are requiring some kind of Athena Swan um, certification. And then when I talk with women around the, this country, I've had a lot of um, comments about it, this being an additional unfair burden on women than men to be on the committees that prepare the nomination. Could I, so. <laughs> could I, could I just intervene here and say actually, uh, one of the things I know sometimes does happen with Athena Swan is that female colleagues get to fill in the documentation, yeah. which is part of the issue that's been raised, or, uh, that's been raised already. But I do think um, that there are major changes elsewhere, maybe not in comp sci, maybe not in maths, which you can see across different European, different European countries in higher education, in politics, in public administration, in different areas, and that it's worthwhile actually thinking about how those work, because I do think myself that significant cultural change is the most effective way possible, but, it really, but it's very difficult to do that from a, very, from a, from a, from a degree of high, a high degree of minoritization within. You don't have the heft to create the cultural change. So it is about the change in behavior changing behaviour of, of the majority to invest in that cultural change. But I think, you know, that the situation in other areas, proportionally speaking, and in terms of change the last 10 years and the last 15 years, has been significantly better than what you're describing. So I think there, that there may be a particular issue here with uh, STEM. I think, um, actually, that's a, a core cool point, that it is cultural change. So if you look at <laughs> physics, um, the proportion of women going into physics hasn't changed in 30 years, despite a, a lot of interventions. But the issue is a lot of the interventions are sort of single point interventions. They're, they're projects that, that maybe last a few months or a, a year, but they aren't dealing with the fundamental problems. So we're talking about cultural problems, we're talking about structural problems, um, process issues. And I think we're starting now to see research that's showing some um, real promise in terms of understanding what those structural problems are. And it's even down to things like um, how we word uh, job ads, that there are sort of certain ways of wording job ads that put women off and attract men. 
um, things about how we talk about STEM careers to young girls. So evidence that you know, girls respond better to adjectives than verbs. And, and this quite interesting work that's being done that means that we've got a better evidence base for our interventions. And it, I'd like to sort of you know, draw the parallel with, um, this is going to be slightly odd, but with um, anyone who needs to change their weight, where the, the idea of a fad diet that you do a temporary change and then you fix the problem, that's the kind of interventions we've been doing. It's about permanent change. It's about understanding kind of the nutrition, if you like, and then applying that on a permanent basis. And I think we are making progress to understand what those permanent changes need to be. Thank you. I realize this is very interesting and I would love to go on, but I'm aware of time and I don't want to lose people. So I, I think it's time to wrap up. I'd just like to say I was really struck by the recurrence of the concept of stories. Each of you, in some point, talked about how we talk about women. And that's certainly something I'm going to remember. And it was about the details, definitely about the details. But only one person mentioned the uh, possibility of purchasing an Ada Lovelace costume. <laughs> and, and I won't forget that. And, before I hand over to Ursula, who's, who's going to, I think, conclude things, I want to say something that, which is possibly a bit dangerous in light of this um, discussion, but I wanted to say a special thank you to Ursula for organising this. You are my role model. <laughs> <laughs> Staff helpers and some more. Where's Jane? Oh, Jane. Jane's gone. And Renata. Jane and Renata. Um, so thank you all for making this such a success. You've seen them all buzzing around in blue T-shirts, doing all sorts of things. You know, I've got two of my postdocs sitting there. It never was in the job description for <laughs> Vasilis to be the complete master of audio. I don't think it was ever in the job description for Gabriella to be <laughs> tweeter in chief. But you know, thank you very much. And a particular thank you to the person sitting in the middle there. Sarah Baldwin, who has been on the end of countless emails, um, on the end of countless emails, um, in June, and suddenly found that it wasn't in her job description either that she was going to organise a conference for 300 people and <laughs> deal with everything from Balliol seating plans. Um, Nick Woodhouse helped us with Balliol seating plan to. Hire of coat racks, BAT, on the hire of coat racks. There you are, that's it. <laughs> Thank you. So we have a, we have a, I oh know, we've had a wonderful party. We've had a wonderful party for Ada Lovelace. We also have a legacy for all this. Um, here in Oxford, we have a remarkable history of programming research, computer science research, two Turing Award winners, Tony Hoare and Dana Scott. The Turing Award is often described as the Nobel Prize of computer science. We have fabulous computing archives in the Bodleian, not just the Lovelace Byron archives, but the Strachey archives, um, the Landin archives. We're starting an initiative to do far more work on those archives, to draw in together a community of scholars we're picking up on what we've been talking about today, not just the nerdy sides of it, but the cultural sides of it as well, the greater influence on science. And our founding funders, if you like, have been the Clay Mathematics Institute. Nick Woodhouse, the president of the Clay Mathematics Institute, is sitting there, who've funded this marvellous digitisation of Ada Lovelace's mathematics, which you're all going to be seeing online after Christmas. So thank you all very much for coming. We've all had a fabulous time, and see you next time. <laughs>